I'm Ann Rancourt from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and I'm here today with my colleague, Dr. Carl Diefenbach, Director of the Division of AIDS. We're here today at NIH to talk about some developments in how NIH does clinical research on HIV. Carl, there are many different types of research, phases of research. What is clinical research? Clinical research is when um, physicians and scientists study disease or even just natural processes in people. So it's a basically what we refer to as human subjects research. And ultimately, because we're dealing directly with people, there's tremendous amount of ethics and other responsibilities, tremendous responsibilities that come with uh, performing this type of research. So it requires additional levels of oversight and additional compliance uh, that we seek uh, to make sure that we are the best we can be at in terms of making sure that we do the best research uh, available. And NIH has a, a rather novel and unique way of structuring and funding its clinical research on HIV, and that's in a network structure. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So a network structure starts from the top, where um, the scientists uh, and physicians who are leading the network get together and decide what are the highest priority questions that need to be addressed, and then design procedures or protocols to evaluate those questions um, in people. But then you have to figure out where do people get their health care. They get it in doctor's offices, in clinics, in hospitals. So by taking the network structure and aligning it with hospitals, with clinics, with doctor's offices, those uh, organizations can help recruit people into the clinical trials so that they can participate in the research and ultimately the, the information that we gather by having their participation will lead to changes in public health and improvement in health care in the United States and the world. And the HIV networks specifically are all over the world. They are all over the world. We have um, clinics um, pretty much all over the world, although the, the networks themselves are all here focused in the United States. And so the networks have had a number of successes and groundbreaking studies over the years. Some that people might be familiar with are the START study, PROMISE, HPTN 052. Tell us a little bit about some of the successes from the so networks. So the, the networks have been with us since the beginning of the epidemic. And the very, coming back to the very first success we ever had in HIV was a, a study called ACTG 076, which demonstrated that the simplest and first antiretroviral we ever had licensed, AZT, could really slow down mother to child transmission by a significant amount. Fast forward to the, one of the more recent results in mother to child transmission. The PROMISE study demonstrated that antiretrovirals to a pregnant woman throughout her, during her pregnancy and during the breastfeeding period could substantially further reduce um, the level of transmission from the mother uh, to the infant. Um, to the order of less than 1%. And that fundamentally gave us the tools to say that we can uh, virtually eliminate perinatal transmission. Other studies have focused on things like what O52 um, focused on. Not only was uh, the antiretrovirals to people good for their health, but if you became durably suppressed and stayed durably suppressed, meaning no virus in your system, you were unable to transmit, uh, incapable of transmitting the virus to your, your partner. And that is where Bruce Richmond and his team have come up with the U equals U idea. Is that the genesis came from that type of research. Wonderful. And so what is new? What's changing with HIV's clinical research paradigm? So we have to think about the progress we've made over the past um, seven to 10 years and think about where we want to be in the future. And as, as such, we need to think about the progress that we could make not just in the next years, but in 10 years. So I think it's very important that we think about where we want to be down the road. And so what is the structure that's, that's changing? You're doing a, a refinement right now. So if, if we look at the progress that's been made to date, it's important that we focus down and focus in three key areas. We need to focus in HIV prevention, HIV therapeutics, and an HIV vaccine. So as such, with three areas of emphasis, we're considering three leadership groups, one in each of those critical areas. And that doesn't mean that they're each siloed and independent, but they can work together. Um, it, so for example, the vaccine network can work with the prevention network and has been uh, in our current structure to bring forward 
the best possible interventions to address the question of keeping people safe um, and protected from acquiring HIV. So you're taking an opportunity today, right now at the present, to look into the future and think strategically about where we need to be with regards to HIV clinical research. Absolutely. So if you think about it, where we are today defines a point in time. If you think about where you want to be, it, uh, it is really a, uh, an opportunity to think about, as you're saying, strategically about the future. So even though we're here at the end of August, we can use a hockey analogy in that what the great one, Wayne Gretzky always said, was skate to where the puck will be. And as such, you will then be more successful, whether it's in ice hockey or in HIV research. In this case, if we think about where we want to be in, in 10 years, in 2027, we want to have a, a safe, effective, and durable HIV vaccine that is an efficacy of about at least 60%. We want to have virtually eliminate, continued the elimination of mother-to-child transmission. We want to have injectables and implantables for therapy and prevention so that, that we can vastly reduce the pill burden that people are dealing with and ultimately a cure that um, is uh, the a sustained virologic remission in the absence of therapy in a significant proportion of HIV positive people living around the world today. Those are the kinds of goals that we need to set for ourselves. Some of them sound unbelievably aspirational, but if you think about the progress that we've made over the past 10 years, they're not so aspirational. But by, by setting these goals and pushing toward them, um, we can achieve. And are there any spot, uh, special populations or co-infections that you'll be focusing on in the future? So let's take a special population first. As we look at an HIV vaccine, who is the ultimate population that we are seeking to vaccinate? Well, all of our studies to date have focused on vaccinating adults. We're evaluating those vaccine in an adult population. But the ultimate goal is to have a vaccine that we would be able to deliver uh, to children prior to the advent, uh, the onset of sexual debut. So that's an important population. We have to first prove it in adults and then work backwards through adolescence to uh, say 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, so that's an example of the kind of work that we'll need to partner on to get moving forward. On the comorbidity side, you cannot solve the HIV epidemic without also tackling tuberculosis. Around the globe, TB and HIV are what we call syndemics. They're epidemics that not only um, move together, but they are synergistic in the worst kind of way for each other. So what you have to do is be able to come up with better treatments and prevention strategies for TB and HIV, and ultimately bring those together in places where TB is uh, such a significant problem, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, in China, and, uh, and other places around the globe so that we can tackle the two epidemics simultaneously. And are you planning to make any, um, um, any structural changes uh, to be able to reach these strategic goals? So I, by structural changes, we're, currently we have the, 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 the leadership, the network structure, which is, this is a little bit of an in, inside baseball, but there are three components. There's a leadership group, there's a data center, and then there's a laboratory, because ultimately, all the data that comes out needs to be put in a place that is accessible and verifiable. The laboratories are obviously responsible for generating the samples and dealing with the samples. But ultimately, there's also the sites. And the sites are those clinics and labs, the clinics and hospitals and doctor's offices around the world that participate. We're very happy with how these are structured. Currently, we have sort of a hub-and-spoke model. We have something called a clinical trials unit, which is an organizing unit that then has sites that it um, sort of as pods that come off uh, so that everything is sort of centralized and then reports back up to the leadership group. I realize for those most of you living, um, being, seeing us at home, that probably isn't relevant to you, but it really does make the system work better to have these two types of structures, the leadership group that is then associated with these CTUs and CRSs, as we call them. And you mentioned an emphasis, of course, on prevention, vaccine, and therapeutics research. How will that play out? So each, it's really important that what, what is unique about every site that we have, it's about the population that they can specifically recruit. So if you have a population, you need a study for that uses 
young adolescent women. The site has to specialize and uh, attend to the needs of that population. If you're dealing with young black MSM in the South, you need sites that can attend to, to, to their specific needs. If you're dealing with TB patients, you obviously have to go where TB is endemic. So the sites have to have the, the populations first and foremost. And then they also need the superior quality clinical researchers associated with them to conduct the research in the most ethical and humane way. And our institute at NIH, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, funds and conducts a lot of research on infectious disease outbreaks like Zika, the Ebola virus. We have this robust HIV clinical research enterprise that you've described. Can that play a role in helping infectious disease research more broadly? So let's take a big step back. The purpose, the raison d'etre of NIH is to improve human health. If we have an infrastructure that is global and robust and productive, why wouldn't we use it to address the needs of other diseases? That said, it has to be, have those sites that, where that research would be done has to have the special population and the needs um, there in order to find the people. Let's take Zika, for example. You wouldn't be doing research on Zika in Switzerland or Finland, but you would in Puerto Rico or um, in the Caribbean and, and, or in Brazil, and as such, those sites would be highly advantageous to be able to use them. But we, at the same time, we have to make sure that the research that we're adding in complements and doesn't detract from the HIV research that's going on. So I think there's a balance here, but absolutely, why wouldn't we do that? And so walk us through the timeline for when these changes will be taking place. So what we are, we're right now in a period of openness where we're taking in comments. And the goal is to make these awards in, um, in September, October of 2020. As such, there's a time period in there where we can no longer take comments, but we're in a very open period now between now and November 30th where we're still very interested in getting feedback and input into our processes. So as such, we have a series of blog posts that have already been posted, and there's information online, and there's a number of ways where people can add their comments uh, and, and, and tell us what they're thinking about this process. And so for people watching at home who are interested in this conversation, what can they do to be a part of things? Tell us what you're thinking. Tell us what your ideas are about the research we should be uh, performing. To, to, to our mind, the most important research that we think is getting uh, significant methods of prevention for adolescent populations, both domestically and internationally. If we don't protect the youth of today, we will be just continuing to propagate the HIV epidemic for the next generation. So we must solve this problem at this point in time, protect youth as we move forward. A vaccine is our future. We need to focus on that. And ultimately, therapy, best therapies moving forward plus a cure will help us really pull together the tools we need to have a significant impact and potentially end the global pandemic. Thank you, Carl. And thank you for watching at home. We hope that you'll visit our website for more information, and we'd love to hear your comments and your questions posted on this Facebook Live video, and we'll be able to answer those online. Thank you so much for watching.